I'm partial to the color yellow, and Bill's bright yellow Airmaster looks so nice against the green grass of the Great Bend Airport. It seems very much at home there. There's just something very Kansas about Cessna and the Airmaster. It's a beauty. Now, in addition to having done such a great job restoring his Airmaster, I think Bill Coling should also have the title of official historian for Cessna Aircraft Company. He showed me a number of very interesting historical documents and photos about Cessna. You should take a look at them. I scanned quite a few that you can view in the extra section of this disc. If you have seen part one of this series, you're already familiar with the Antique Airplane Association and its picturesque aerodrome situated just outside Blakesburg, Iowa. You also met founder Robert Taylor and his grandson, Ben. So now you'll get to meet the middleman of the AAA dynasty, Brent Taylor, who is going to take us on a tour of a small part of the artifacts and airplanes that comprise the Air Power Museum located on Antique Airfield. Here is Brent Taylor. Welcome to the Air Power Museum, based at Antique Airfield near Blakesburg, Iowa. It's also home of the Antique Airplane Association. Antique Airfield was a dream of my father and his business partner. Uh, so was the Air Power Museum. It was started to replicate an airport in the 1930s and to give uh, antique airplane enthusiasts a place to bring their airplanes, a center to bring their airplanes to enjoy antique aircraft, flying them, restoring them, and to act as a center uh, to be able to help people uh, be able to restore their aircraft. The Air Power Museum consists of several buildings and facilities at the Antique Airfield. We have a display area of about 20,000 square feet to display uh, our memorabilia, our engines, our propellers, uh, our aircraft. We also have a dedicated 4,300 square foot library of flight, which is a research center to, uh, for people to uh, come research antique airplanes, research a particular airplane. Um, and we have lots of interesting displays in the museum. Couple, number one, a Hisso engine, which is a very famous engine, was used in everything from World War I fighters up through the uh, classic biplanes of the 19, late 1920s and 30s, aircraft like Hisso Wacos, Travelers, whatnot. One of the most interesting engines we have in our collection of many here at the Air Fire Museum is the multi-X rotary engine. It's a uh, twin row, uh, counter-rotating uh, rotary engine. Rotary engines were of the early development of engines used a lot in World War I and the World War I fighters. Later on, when they made the cylinder stationary, they became known as radial engines. The Multi-X was not a successful engine, but it was an interesting try at rotaries. Uh, we actually own the remains of the company, which includes all the stock certificates, and the only example of the engine. Uh, being a rotary, the whole engine rotates. It's basically a two-cycle engine with the exhaust handled by an uh, intake handle here and exhaust handled atmospherically. Um, when it rotates, this one being a counter rotating off this gearbox, is the prop rotates opposite of the engine rotation, which was to take care of the torque. Rotaries have a terrible amount of torque. Very few antiques left today flying with Hesso engines, a handful. SC5 replica or two, a couple of Travelers, a couple of Wacos. Um, I've always considered personally that the Hissel was one of the holy grail of uh, aircraft engines, the holy grail being uh, Hissel engines, OX-5s, and J-5 Wright powered aircraft. 
Fortunately, I've gotten two out of three. One of those is a Hisso. I got to fly a Hisso Traveler several years ago uh, here off of Antique Airfield. And um, the airplane and the engine have a lot of torque. And uh, when you open the throttle on a Hisso, uh, you definitely know you got some horsepower underneath, your, underneath you. Our engine collection doesn't just extend to World War I and strange rotary engines. We have more common engines as well. Seven cylinder Jacobs is an engine found on a lot of antique airplanes flying around today, commonly Wacos, uh, bamboo bombers and such. A lot of people always want to know why radial engines have an odd number of cylinders. And it's very simply, if you had an even number of cylinders, you would have two cylinders firing together at the same time. They have to be in a four cycle or a four stroke engine, they have to fire uh, every other cylinder and therefore you need an odd number of cylinders, whether it's three, five, seven, nine, uh, etc. When you get into the double row radials, such as the multi-motor was, you uh, have actually, even though there's an even number of cylinders total, it's there are rows of odd number of cylinders. We also have a collection of small four-cylinder horizontally opposed engines like the Franklin A50 here, which was an engine used on light planes like Cubs and T-Crafts in the 1930s. One of the more unusual engines we have in the Air Power Museum collection is this 12-cylinder horizontally opposed Franklin engine. The story on these, from what we understand, is these were all built by the Franklin Aircraft Engine Company for the Northrop Flying Wing Program after the war. They were ordered by Jack Northrop. They specified horsepower, even with the supercharger on back, did not come to pass when they put them in a test cell and tested them, so the engines were never used and dispersed around various parts of the country. Uh, I have seen about six others of these engines, most of them in museums. This one showed up in a local auction. And one of our lifetime members, Roy Good, uh, determined that we ought to have this on display in the museum, so he bought it for the museum and donated it, and uh, we've had it on display here since then. The air engine's very heavy, and it would have been very tough to cool in any configuration, but this specifically would have been a pusher configuration, not a tractor configuration. Besides engines, the Air Power Museum also has an interesting collection of props. One of the most interesting, I feel, is this almost nine foot propeller built by the Jacuzzi Company. Most people would recognize Jacuzzi as in the plumbing business, building hot tubs and whatnot, but most don't know that they started out building propellers in World War I. Uh, the Jacuzzi brothers uh, were one of the biggest manufacturers of propellers in World War I, providing the US Army military with propellers for their jennies and standards and whatnot. And this is an example of one of those propellers. This prop is longer than most props you would see nowadays on an aircraft, even though it's only for a 90 horse engine. 104 inches long, lots of torque, slow turning, about 12 to 1400 RPM at cruise. The Jacuzzi brothers were also, or also known today, in the wine business, which apparently they had started in even before they were in the propeller business. And they do have a big winery right next to the Shellville Airport in Sonoma, California, where they apparently they have reportedly quite a collection of these propellers in their offices. Beautiful. Now, this prop would have commonly been used on an OX-5 engine. In fact, this one is stamped OX-5. This is a Curtis OX-5 engine. This is probably one of the most iconic engines ever built and is one of what I consider, again, the holy trio of the OX-5, the Hisso, and the J-5 Wright. The OX-5 is a water-cooled V8, 90 horsepower. They were used on aircraft from World War I up through the 1920s. It's virtually every manufactured aircraft in the late 20s, one model or other, used the OX-5 engine. There's still quite a few OX-5 airplanes flying today. They uh, built so many parts in World War I, the parts could still be found uh, via the, the uh, collector's grapevine, as it were, of antique aircraft. In our collections, we have a World War II area. And in that area, we have several engines, models, uh, various memorabilia. And uh, we have things like an Allison V1710 engine, which was probably one of the most well-known engines out of World War II. It was used in aircraft like the P-39, the P-38, and the P-40. It was one of the mainstays of, uh, of our war effort. Uh, also had Ranger engines like this 200 horse Ranger, and there's another Ranger up there that were used in training airplanes like this PT-19. That's also a PT-19 model. Then there was the Ranger V-12 engine, which wasn't as well known, 
but was used in uh, aircraft such as the SOC off of naval ships and uh, the Fairchild AT-21, which is a big twin engine airplane. It's still an engine that is in use in a few home builds today. Uh, we have local airplane around here called the Moraine Salme that has one in it. Finally in the back we have a Pratt & Whitney R2800. Uh, air-cooled engine was the mainstay air-cooled engine in a lot of frontline fighters during World War II, including the P-47 and the F-4U Corsair. The Air Power Museum, besides its collections of engines, propellers, models, memorabilia, also has an outstanding collection of antique and home-built aircraft, numbering 40 in total. We're now in our main museum display hangar, which uh, only hangers a few of the aircraft, but this is the where we keep the prime aircraft collection at. I'm standing beside a 1929 Fleet Model 7 that uh, we've had for years. Uh, the aircraft come out of the San Francisco area and it actually back in the late 30s had hauled air mail during National Air Mail Week. The fleet is powered by a 145 horse Warner seven cylinder radial engine, air cooled. Um, fleets typically had either Warners or mostly Kenner engines on them. Good performing little biplane, a uh, lot of fun to fly and for a long time not this particular airplane but a fleet held in the 30s held the outside loop record up in the, and that record stood until the 1970s. Another interesting airplane in our collection is this 1938 Porterfield CP-40 Zephyr. Uh, the airplane was built in Kansas City. This is the only remaining flyable example in the world. There are two other basket cases that we know about. The aircraft was powered by an A-40 Continental engine, which is the first of the horizontally opposed four-cylinder engines, which has led to most modern engines today. So that is a very historic engine. This aircraft is kept in flyable condition, and uh, we do fly it on occasion. All of our museum aircraft have an interesting history, but this aircraft has probably one of the most unique histories of any of our aircraft. It's a 1929 monoprep, built by the Mono Aircraft Corporation, Moline, Illinois. It has a five-cylinder air-cooled, 60-horse Beely engine. The historic significance of this aircraft is it was the airplane that Martin and Osa Johnson learned how to fly in in Chinook, Kansas. Martin and Osa Johnson were famous for their aerial explorations of Africa in two Sikorsky flying boats for National Geographic magazine in late in the 1920s and early 30s. This aircraft was also owned for a time by Walt Conance and his brother. Though they got in a lot of trouble with the airplane and actually lost their licenses before World War II, Walt went on to become an ace, and which was very rare considering he was in a photo recon outfit and very few photo recon pilots ever became aces in World War II. A few weeks ago, we had a gentleman visit the museum who also learned how to fly in this airplane back in the early 1930s when the aircraft was in the Chinook, Kansas air area. The aircraft was built as a trainer, and that's where the, most of the history of this aircraft come from. And they, again, they only built 13 of them, and this is the only one left in existence. We hope you enjoyed this little preview of our vast collections we have here at the Air Power Museum, and we hope that you'll come visit us. We're open regular hours, 9 to 5 Monday through Friday, 10 to 5 on Saturday, and 1 to 5 on Sunday. We're just east of Blakesburg, Iowa on the Bluegrass Road. Come visit what is an old-time airport with a real neat collection of airplanes, engines, propellers, and memorabilia. The Air Power Museum. If you fly into the antique airfield, you can park right at the entrance of the museum. If you come by car, it's just a little ways off Highway 63 in Southeast Iowa. They have good directions on their website.